Thank you, Brian. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. And I want to say uh, just overall, I'm honored to be here. I appreciate the chance to share with you all today. And I'm grateful for your time and presence. Um, one of the things you may have heard if you were early to the meeting is Brian talking about Lida Barrett and connecting folks. And I'll just say um, one of the things that I have so appreciated in my career about Brian Winkle is the way that he connects people. Um, one of the great fortunes in my professional life is that I met Brian Winkle at a very young age, uh, and he's been a friend and mentor since. And Brian, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for all of that. And I know there are many people at this meeting, new friends and old alike, who feel that way. And I just, I wanted to start today by saying, um, as Brian hides his videos so that he can't turn crimson on the screen, um, Brian is a, a visionary and a rare person who um, is unafraid of hard work, who loves to found new things and is never, uh, never afraid of an ambitious project. Um, uh, Heiko, if I've said your name right, has put the in the chat the link to my slides, which you might want to click if you want to be on it. But I do want to say before I start, I would love it if folks who are on this call could express their gratitude to Brian Winkle for founding Simeode, for mentoring people, for doing all these different things that make new things possible so that more people have access to mathematics and more people can engage with one another. So if, if you would be so kind to express that to Brian, uh, that would be a wonderful thing for us to do to start. And so as you can see on my slides here, I do have them listed at this short URL. That's gbsu.edu slash s slash the number one capital B capital J. And uh, these slides will stay there after this talk. And that is also on my last slide today. So this conference is centered on modeling with differential equations, um, applying calculus. And so as I come to you to make a plea for more linear algebra, I do want to say, and say so partly as an author of a calculus text, um, Calculus is awesome. Uh, there's all sorts of fantastic stuff you can do with it. And of course, so is linear algebra. The, the genesis for the title of this talk really goes back to an essay that uh, Professor Gil Strang of MIT published around 2000, which is linked at the bottom of this slide, titled Too Much Calculus. Uh, I'm phrasing this more positively with saying more linear algebra. But as I, I poked around for some conversation online about some of the tension in the curriculum between calculus and linear algebra, the, the link here is an, is an interesting conversation among practitioners about the values of both. Um, professionals who work in industry, and one of the quotes that I pulled there is this, this great notion of, if you wanna study anything that moves, um, doing any kind of design with them is literally impossible without calculus. And as we've seen in different talks and, and conversations in this conference, we've seen that calculus and with the differential equations are so useful for modeling in the physical world around us. But in his essay, Professor Strang said, linear algebra's applications touch many more students than calculus. We are in a digital world now. Uh, and he said that 20 years ago, and it's absolutely true today. And so one of the things that uh, I want us to do is to think about the call that Professor Strang put to us, where in that essay, he pointed out that in, in many university curricula, calculus might get three classes plus differential equations plus vector analysis. There might, be, there might be four or five classes and only one linear algebra. And I, I want to urge us all to think about ways that linear algebra shapes our lives and how we can, can learn and teach more of it. So I wanna start off by sharing just a few thoughts about what's amazing about linear algebra. And I wanna say a special word of thanks to my friend and colleague, David Austin, who works across the hall from me. You'll see his work cited throughout much of this talk. But um, David is a, a gifted mathematician and teacher, a tremendous expositor, and he's, he's taught me personally a lot about how to think about linear algebra. So one of the things I love about linear algebra, and I'm teaching it this semester, I have 30 students that I teach by Zoom, and we're using the book that David has written that's linked to here at the bottom of the page, is that it starts in the simplest of places. All you really need to do to be able to start thinking about linear algebra is be able to add and multiply and know what a line is. And indeed, at the very start of linear algebra, we think about situations like you see on my screen, a single line or maybe two lines that fall on top of one another, a pair of lines that might intersect, or three lines that don't share a common intersection point. And at this very simple foundation that is something a middle school student can think about, this forms the beginning of really all of linear algebra that when you generalize that to n variables in m-dimensional space, 
this beautiful theory emerges. And so one of the things that I also really love about linear algebra is tied to something that I once heard Mike Orison of Harvey Mudd College talk about what he likes about mathematics generally. And that's the value of viewing ideas from different perspectives. And indeed in linear algebra, in some sense, almost every problem in a first semester linear algebra course can go back to a simple system of equations. That's a straightforward thing for, again, for students to understand at any, at any level. But if you look at it from a different perspective and you start to think about, well, there's this, this vector 2, 4, 1 that's hiding right here. And there's this vector 0, minus 1, 3. And you can then express that system of equations as a question about vectors. And so that brings in the geometry of three-dimensional space. You can also think about with that system, you can think about representing it in a matrix and thinking about an augmented matrix and learn about row reduction and how you can, can transform that to an equivalent system that's easy to see the solution. And then eventually you start to think about putting those three vectors together in a matrix and learning about matrix vector multiplication. And with matrix vector multiplication, uh, then you can go ahead and express this equation in a super simple fashion. AX is equal to B, which is like the familiar equation 2X is equal to 7. So I'll say just as an aside, I don't know my audience today. I know there are a lot of mathematicians in the audience who know linear algebra and likely folks who teach it. I also know there's a lot of students on the call. And so I wanted to assume that people hadn't necessarily seen linear algebra before. Um, and if you haven't, it's no big deal to think about the details. And if you have, I hope that there are new perspectives here as we work our way toward thinking about some really cool applications. So here's just a, a slightly more formal version to think about what we just looked at with a three by three system. So here's the more general case for these different ways that you can think about a system of equations that are all again tied to this fundamentally simple equation, AX is equal to B. And from this, linear algebra is really born. And so right now um, in my linear algebra class, we're four weeks into the semester and my students have, have already started to master the ideas of how they can view these ideas from different perspective and are starting to think about more sophisticated ideas like the span of a set of vectors. In Strang's essay, he says another thing about linear algebra that's one of my favorite parts of the subject. He says, we know everything when we know what happens to a basis. And so a basis is a linearly independent spanning set. And basically what that basis tells us is that if, if you know what happens to the basis in three-dimensional space that involves three vectors, then you know what happens to every single vector in the entire space. So this ability to move from maybe knowing about just three things to being able to talk about everything, an infinite collection, is again, one of the incredibly powerful things about linear algebra. In the example on my screen here, we see that if you have an unknown matrix, but you know what it does to the standard basis of R2, so that is the vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1, which form the columns of the 2 by 2 identity matrix, just knowing how that matrix multiplies those two vectors tells us what the matrix A it is, is itself. And in fact, A is the 3 by 2 matrix whose columns are these two vectors here. So proposition 2.5.4 from Professor Austin's book is the more formal statement of that result we've just seen, that if you want to determine a matrix, thinking about it as a matrix transformation, if you know what happens to the columns of the identity matrix, the standard basis of Rn, then you know the columns of that matrix. Uh, a more sophisticated result that we see a little further along in first semester linear algebra, work that my students will encounter before the end of this first semester, is that if you happen to have a square matrix, and that matrix has a basis of eigenvectors, then that matrix is fundamentally like a diagonal matrix. And so again, for students on the call, if you don't know, yet know what an eigenvector is, an eigenvector is just a special vector that when you multiply a, a, a matrix by that vector, the result is that the vector only gets stretched. So there's very little change that happens to that vector. And then it turns out is that if you have enough of those vectors, then the matrix that you're working with, which might be uh, very complicated and have, have all non-zero entries, that it, it actually acts like this diagonal matrix, which is in some sense, the simplest of all matrices. And so again, this comment of Professor Strang that we know everything when we know what happens to a basis. If you can find n linearly independent eigenvectors for an n by n matrix, you know all sorts of important things about that matrix. Now we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about some, some powerful applications of linear algebra. But from a philosophical point of view, I want to point out a couple of my favorite quotes about mathematics. <clears throat> 
So back in 1960, a physicist named Eugene Wigner wrote an essay titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. And the whole essay is beautiful. And I've linked to it here with the link behind his name. And I urge you to read it if you never have. But there's a quote in there that always resonates with me where he says, the enormous usefulness of mathematics and the natural sciences is something bordering on the mysterious. And there is no rational explanation for it. Albert Einstein had a quote that makes me think of these things as well, saying, how can it be that mathematics, being after all a product of human thought, independent of experience, is so admirably adapted to the objects of reality? This is one of the mysteries uh, that many of us who work in mathematics are fascinated by, that mathematics in some sense starts in this very abstract place just in our head. Geometry with wondering about shapes, linear algebra with wondering about a couple of lines in the plane and what happens with them. So we play with these ideas and we develop a formal system around them, then all of a sudden this formal system starts to have profound and powerful applications that explain how the world around us works in ways that are often unreasonably effective. I'll say just as an aside, another reason I think linear algebra is important based on Brian McDonald's great talk last night on, on data science and sports analytics is it's a chance to develop multivariable thinking. So in a, in a simpler setting than multivariable calculus, it's not a stretch to think about an N variable problem, thinking about vectors and matrices and more. And then especially to instructors who are on the call today who teach linear algebra, I wanna quote my friend, Dave Kung, who in his recent uh, HAMO award-winning talk at the joint math meetings, uh, urged us all who teach mathematics to quote, sell the brownie, not the recipe. And this is an analogy that he took from politics where the folks on Pod Save America said, if you, have a great, uh, if you have a great proposal that government can do to solve a problem, you should talk about how it's gonna make people's lives better, not what the policy details are behind it. And I, I've just been guilty of this to a small extent where I've talked about the abstractions of linear algebra and some of the theory and the things that are fascinating about that. But what I think really grabs the attention of students is, what, good, what is linear algebra good for? And what is mathematics generally? And so I, one of the things I love again is that the focus of this conference is on modeling. And so what, what can we say about epidemiology and population trends and more? And to get our students engaged with real problems where they can see the applications of mathematics. And one of the things that's so great about linear algebra is you can get right to that in the first semester. So let's look at some amazing applications of linear algebra here. So one of those is in computer graphics. As an interesting fluke of the universe, I had never seen the movie, The Pixar Story until last night when uh, I joined my wife on the couch and she said, do you wanna watch The Pixar Story? I was like, absolutely I do. It's perfectly time for my talk tomorrow. So if you haven't seen that movie from 2007, it's a fantastic story about Pixar Studios and the principles there, in particular, the three founders, uh, John Lasseter, uh, Edwin Catmull and Steve Jobs. And Ed Catmull um, is a mathematician. He got his PhD at the University of Utah in the early 1970s. And he was one of the first people to enter the field of computer science. And he was fascinated with computer graphics. At an MAA conference, I once saw Ed give a talk and it was about the work at Pixar Studios. And what he spoke about in the talk was about the linear algebra that's behind the movies that they make. And so when you look at figures like Remy pictured here from Ratatouille, there's all sorts of complicated mathematics that goes on to represent these figures. But fundamentally, you have a collection of points that you need to track. It's a perfectly natural thing to store those points in a matrix. Uh, and then to move those points around in the visual field, basically what it comes down to is matrix multiplication. So the, the three by three matrix that you see at the bottom of the page here is, uh, is one that enables us to move a figure in two dimensions. So moving in three dimensions is, is more complicated, but students in a first semester linear algebra class can quickly explore and see um, what happens with graphics here. I wanna briefly play a portion of this YouTube video that features some of the work of Pixar here. And just have you see some of the ideas and the mathematics that gets talked about right away here by one of the folks who works at Pixar Studios. I thought I had that set so the ad wouldn't play. Sorry about that. We'll skip it here. There we go. <laughs> 
There is no sound. Okay. Since there's no sound that people were announcing in the chat, I will skip the video. That was the only portion that I was going to use with sound, and I apologize for that. You have the link to it, so I would urge you on your own time to go watch it. I'm going to just scroll ahead to see just a little bit. Um, so this is the hand of the character Jerry from Jerry's Game, the Academy Award winning short film of the old man who plays chess against himself in the park. Uh, when I saw Ed Catmull's talk at MathFest one year, one of the things he was talking about is what happens in computer graphics when you get your linear algebra wrong. And he had examples of the old man Jerry where he would get up to move to the other side of the table to make a chess move against himself and his clothes would stay behind. Uh, and other sorts of outtakes like that that were really quite fantastic. So um, I will jump back to my own slides here like this, and I'll leave that link for you all later. But computer graphics, again, is a place early in linear algebra where students, through the idea of matrix vector multiplication, can start to see how figures move around the plane. Uh, for my own students this semester, we just have finished four weeks of the course. Uh, we have next week, we're going to focus on the ideas of linear independence. And then the week after that, week six, we're going to do transformations and the geometry of the plane. And my students will do a lab activity where they engage with moving a, a two dimensional figure around the two dimensional plane using matrix multiplication to do so. There's lots of great examples that uh, a person can see with applications in digital images, which are a key part of our lives. So one place that linear algebra plays a role is to think about edge detection. And so here's an example again from, from David Austin's linear algebra book, thinking about how the edges can be shown here uh, uh, in this particular figure from, uh, anal from an analysis of the numerical data that's behind the scene in storing that image. Another key place that we, uh, we emphasize in our, in our linear algebra class at Grand Valley and through David's book is to have students learn about the JPEG compression algorithm. So when we look at an image like this beautiful picture on the left, if you zoom in on parts of it, you frequently see uh, grids that look more like this, where there's almost constant uh, color and hue in the image that's there. And in fact, if you learn a little bit about chrominance and luminance, you can start to see some of the numerical values that are used to represent uh, these, these images behind the scenes. And you can start to think about, say, an eight by eight matrix like the one on the right. So back to the idea of basis, while there's the standard basis, which is the columns of the identity matrix, which if you were thinking about eight by eight matrices, you would think about um, the eight by eight identity matrix, it turns out that that's not a good basis to represent this data here. But if you use a cleverly chosen basis, one that in some sense picks up averages and differences and, and helps you detect where there's lots of constancy, like places like this where everything's close to 160, you can represent this data with much less space. And so a well-chosen basis can enable us to, to gain a very large compression ratio so that it takes maybe one tenth or one fifth the space to store an image uh, than storing the raw data. But probably my favorite example of a first semester linear algebra application and one I want us to talk about just a bit more uh, in more detail here is the Google PageRank algorithm. And so here uh, on my screen, you see a way through a directed graph that you can model what the internet looks like. So this is an internet that has just eight web pages. Uh, I checked this morning and there are currently about 2 billion websites on the internet with some 400 million or, or so of them that are active. But as you think about Google trying to index those web pages and build a graph, you have to think about a graph that would have something on the order of 400 million to 2 billion nodes. And that's gonna affect the size of the matrix that we work from. Now, the brilliance of Google's model of the internet, which led to uh, what some have come to call the billion dollar eigenvector that we'll see in just a moment, is that if you think about a particular web page, you think about it as, uh, as having some ranking and it gets that ranking in some sense from its popularity with other pages. And then it can share the value of that ranking with other pages to enhance their popularity. So if you look at this X5 right here, you see that there are two inflows to it, that web page seven links to five and web page three links to five. So X5 gets value from X3 and X7. And then this node five gives value away. It gives value to six, to eight, and to seven. 
And so the way we conceptualize this with not knowing what those rankings are in advance is that we let these, uh, these variables x1 up to x8 represent the page's ranking that we want to try to find. And we get equations like this that we say, well, x5's ranking is going to be tied to, in one sense, the fact that it gets ranking from x3 and it gets half of x3 because x3 links to two pages. And then it gets half of x7's ranking because x7 rank links to two pages. And you'll see in other equations where for a page like page five that gives away its ranking to three places, that ranking then gets divided by three. So if you build all the equations that look like this one, you get an eight by eight system like we see right here on the left. And this system of equations, one of the things that you see right here is that the vector x itself that's unknown appears on the left. So in theory, what we want to solve is x is equal to g times x. But this matrix g is super special for lots of reasons. One thing that you might notice is that if you look at any column, and columns are tied to where matrices uh, share their ranking with other ones, like x1 shares half of its ranking with x2 and half with x3, so you see half its ranking here and half its ranking there, the columns of this matrix are gonna always add up to one. And so that makes this matrix a stochastic matrix. And these have all sorts of important and fantastic properties. And if you can make that matrix in such a way that, uh, that it's actually what's called a positive matrix where there aren't any zeros present, and this one does of course have zeros present, then there's a, there's a famous result called the perron frobenius theorem that, um, that tells us that really fantastic things happen when to solve this equation, we think about estimating. And basically the spirit is we make a guess of what we think the solution is to X is equal to G times X. And that's related to the eigenvalue eigenvector problem that I alluded to earlier. And it turns out that if you make a guess and you iterate and that matrix G is sufficiently well behaved with just this Google matrix is close. then what happens is, is after we iterate a little bit, um, we come to uh, at least a very good approximation of a vector x that satisfies this equation. So I'm going to just shift over to Professor Austin's book where I've got some uh, some work prepared here. And so you can see uh, this is a book that's written in the free and open source language pretext to generate HTML versions of mathematics, uh, mathematical texts. It has embedded sage cells in it so that students can evaluate. And Professor Austin has prepared things in here that I've, that I've added to. I'm just going to show that if we evaluate the sage here to run, um, to uh, to to run the code right here, you can see that I've entered my Google matrix right here, and then what's happened is, is I've run the first ten steps of this so-called Markov chain, and what I'm getting is I'm getting vector outputs that result just simply from multiplying by the matrix G over and over again, and while this sequence does not converge. One of the things that you can see is that things do seem to be bouncing around in such a way that the highest entry in the vector is coinciding with the last entry in the vector, the eighth entry. And if you think about how, uh, if you think about how that web page, the, the, this internet model of eight pages looks, there's sort of an intuition where we look at, at eight here that eight looks like a pretty popular page. That might be the one that, uh, that is the, the page that should be ranked the highest. So um, there's some interesting discussion further on in Professor Austin's text here where he talks about how Google gets around this problem of that sequence not converging right in the right way. And basically there's a way that you can kind of take a weighted average of the Google matrix with another matrix to make sure you have an all positive entry matrix. And then after a couple of steps of iteration, you get pretty quick convergence. So again, there's sophisticated problems to solve here from Google's standpoint. Um, there's sophisticated problems to solve here from Google's standpoint in terms of the numbers and the size of uh, the number of web pages and the size of the matrices involved. But the fundamental ideas are ones that are absolutely accessible to students. And you can just see, I'm just going to scroll just a little bit here and leave it to you to look uh, look on your own time. But Professor Austin here at the end of chapter four, which is part of a first semester course is again, getting students to think about probability vectors and stochastic matrices and how this iterative process enables us to think about finding this dominant eigenvector and the role that that plays in telling us kind of behavior over time. Just a couple more examples here to share. Oh, and I'll just say, 
iterating is unreasonably effective. There's a great book out there called uh, Over and Over Again that's about numerical methods in mathematics and how stunning it is that we can make a guess at a solution to a problem, apply some process, and then take the result of that process and just apply that process again. And so often if you do that, good stuff happens, like here when you iterate a stochastic matrix. Just as a brief COVID example, linear algebra has found key applications in pooled testing. So tapestry is a new novel approach to pooled testing where here the idea is if you had a if you had 100 samples, if you grouped them into two different ways to think about groups of 10, a group of 10 rows and a group of 10 columns, you can, you can instead of performing 100 individual tests, you can get it down to something like 22. And then there's goals for how you can even get beyond that. So linear algebra is, is continuing to find interesting applications of course, in our world today. And then I wanted to share one more of my favorite examples, and that comes from the singular value decomposition, where um, here's an example where the, the matrix on the left is the agreement matrix among Supreme Court justices. So if you look down this diagonal, you see that every Supreme Court justice on this particular court agreed with themselves 100% of the time. In a, uh, But if you looked at something like uh, this 87 right here, you'd see that Justice Kennedy and Justice Souter agreed with one another 87% of the time. So if you take this matrix right here, you can perform something called the singular value decomposition, which is a second semester linear algebra topic for students. In our course at Grand Valley, we spend about half the semester focusing on the singular value decomposition and its many applications. And if you find some things that are called the right and left singular vectors, and you focus on the second singular vectors and you pair them up and you plot the xy coordinates that result from those singular vectors. Those xy coordinates turn out to be tied to the individual locations in this matrix. And if you're familiar with the politics of this particular Supreme Court, you might know that Justice Scalia was a very famous conservative judge and that Justice Roberts and Justice Thomas were also ones that, that had conservative leanings. Whereas justices like Souter and Ginsburg and Breyer uh, tended to be more liberal. And so when you look at this matrix right here, that's just the agreement matrix, it doesn't tell you who thinks in what way. And yet this matrix factorization, the singular value decomposition somehow reveals the, the, the political feelings or beliefs of the people themselves in really profound ways. So as I work to close my talk, I offer a plea in two directions to say uh, on, on in search of more linear algebra. If you're a student, however much linear algebra you've learned, I urge you, learn more. The singular value decomposition in particular is one of the most valuable tools in all of mathematics. Um, one of my former students uh, who I had in a linear algebra two course where we spent a lot of time with the SVD, uh, he wrote this to me. And I was, I was really struck by his email that came to me one day out of the blue and made my day where he said, every problem, every data set, every domain required framing and matrix terms and applying SVDs. And so for you students that are out there, wherever you are in your education, I just urge you to find good resources for you to learn about more. And I, I just can't recommend Professor Austin's book highly enough. Um, many linear algebra books emphasize theory over practice. And David has framed the book around practical problems that are accessible that linear algebra can help solve. And so there's really wonderful things to look at there. And for instructors who are, who are present today at the conference, I just wanna say, however much linear algebra your in institution teaches, I urge you to teach more and especially the applications. It's so important for those of us who do this work to sell the brownie, not the recipe. It's very easy for us to get bogged down in theory and proof and technical details and all these other kinds of things. When for many of our students, the 85% of math majors who will not go to graduate school, but will go find jobs in industry. What's really important is they can understand how to apply these ideas. And the SVD is of course, one of those most valuable tools out there. Uh, my Grand Valley colleagues and I, several of us who worked on the curriculum redesign at Grand Valley, we wrote an, an MAA focus article. So if you're an instructor who wants to learn more about our work, that would be a great place to start at that link right there. And I know that my colleagues who are co-authors on that would be happy uh, to chat with you if you wanted to reach out to any of us with questions. On this slide, I just have some other great reading there. So uh, Professor Austin, in addition to having written a beautiful linear algebra book, writes for the AMS feature column. And all of those columns are awesome, but there's a couple of my favorites that are linked there that I think you would enjoy, as well as a couple of papers on the singular value decomposition, 
and an interview about the role that the SVD played back in the early Netflix prize competition. And with that, I just want to say thank you to you all so much for being here today. Again, to Brian for the invitation um, and to say that my slides are here at this link. And if you have additional questions, I would be glad to hear from you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, we have a few questions, possibly. Uh, as many of you can see in the chat, Jason Andrews essentially comes down with the statement. It said, at the end of the semester of linear algebra, we hadn't solved many different problems. We solved one problem and 20 different things. Um, there are many common themes. Uh, singular value decomposition is, is one of them. Um, so the professor praised him by saying, when I had made that comment, it showed I actually understood the subject by seeing these common themes. Uh, Absolutely. Good pedagogy, because Jason remembered that. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I, I, I totally agree with Matt about singular value decomposition. I, I, I was teaching a course in cryptology and you can take any newspaper cryptogram and put in the digraph frequencies. There's how often AA appears in AB. Mm -hmm. And with that 26 by 26 mm -hmm. matrix, you can tell what are the vowels and what are the consonants? It's just amazing. And that was Cleve Moeller, who is the founder of MATLAB that wrote a beautiful article. And uh, I thought, this is so cool. And, and here we are with Google and all kinds of stuff. And you mentioned that the second course featured singular value decomposition. Um, like half of the course was it? I mean, or more? Yeah. OK. And do people ever say the letters SVD? Yes. OK. I just don't hear it in parlance. I hear the whole oh, big okay. thing all the time, you know? Oh, um, no, we always, we, always just, we always just say SVD. But, OK, know. good. OK. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, so the, the link in the chat that Jennifer has just put there, folks have been asking if there's an organization like Simeode for differentially or, or for linear algebra. And I, I don't believe there's anything as extensive, but the, the materials at the inquiry oriented linear algebra project are they're really well done. So those those are great things there. Um, one of the you cannot see. Oh, they can't see the link. Brian, is there a way to make that? I guess we're the only one seeing the link, but the, in the chat here. Um, oh, any, everybody can read the chat. And in fact, if you want, as a, a listener, you can um, copy and paste from the chat, you can also hit the three links that'll save the entire chat file. Okay. Um, so you can get to that or, no, or you can just cut and paste it out of there. So it's there. Here we, I, I'll, I'll get it here. Hang on one second. I see the issue. It was only to the panelists. Oh. And so I don't have the ability to send it to everyone. Uh, Looks like that we got it to all attendees. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Excellent. Okay, any other conversations, uh, questions? Um, if not, uh, we want to give a, a, a fine round of applause to Matt. Thank you very much. Um, that was a round of applause, I think, when I did that. Uh, and thank him for coming out of the tundra in Michigan to the warmth of our screens. Um, and you should look for your next available opportunity to read Primus, which he edits. And if you get on their um, list and their social media, Brian Katz will let you know of article after article that are coming downstream, a good number of them involving linear algebra. So uh, once again, thank you.